All right. All right, gentlemen, if you could just introduce yourself and then the, the floor is yours. Okay, great. So my name is Tillman Vonderlind. I'm a registered massage therapist. I've been a registered massage therapist for 43 years. And I have uh, run many more years than that. I, I ran my first marathon when I was nine years old. My track coach at that time found out that I was running uh, across the city three times a week. So that's 10K across the city three times a week and he said wow you could probably run a marathon and so i decided oh you know young and stupid nine nine years old i thought okay sure i'll sign up for one and so i did a run walk uh for that first marathon and um finished it a lot of people thought it was crazy to do it but it felt so good i just kept on going and so i've always been a runner and my uh, legs and my body have been my greatest teacher, really. You know, I've had so many issues with legs and ankles and knees and hips and backs. Oh, my God. But I've been able to tailor my treatment styles to those things and it seems to help other people. So happy for the uh, experience in running. So anybody who has run for a few years probably is going through the same situations that they hurt themselves and would like to know how to fix themselves and and so that's why i'm here is this is a public service and uh, let's see what we can do with the knee the knee oh my goodness look at that knee oh so you wouldn't think that that is uh like almost 50 years of running a little bit more running it still works pretty good so what do we got here? We have a lot of things going on here. I'd like to talk about probably the most common issue with the um, with the knee, and it's called a jumper's knee. And the jumper's knee, the pain will be felt here underneath the kneecap usually, or right below the kneecap. There is another issue that is down at the shin here, that's called Osgood Schlatter's problem, it's shin bone pain, and that's a different thing. We'll cover both of those, but I want to focus on the jumper's knee first, because that one is usually an issue with overtraining, or let's say um, going too far, too fast, too soon, or, or not having a good program in place to actually uh, train up to it, to what your body is doing. You know, muscles will develop and sometimes there's loads on your knees that are going to be a little bit more than they should be. And then that's where you start to get a little bit of pain. Not to worry, it's not the end of the world. There's other issues that are a little bit more catastrophic, but uh, we'll cover them too. Okay, so jumper is neat. All right, what do we have here? The cause is overuse, poor training techniques, and then of course, uh, flat foot. Now flat foot, what happens is when you have a flat foot, the knee actually internally rotates a little bit and it puts a little bit more strain on the actual angle of the knee. So if I was to stand up here like that, there would be a Q angle. So if I was bow-legged, it'd be out like that. If I was X-legged like that or knock knee, it'd be in like that. But as for me, I'm pretty straight, normal. So my kneecaps here do tend to drift a little bit out to the outside. This one you can see maybe a little bit more than this one. So, and maybe I have to work on some issues here with the hip because that's, this is an issue with me that I'm going through right now. Oh, hmm. So, jumpers knee, oh my goodness. So there are a few things that you have to be aware of here as to what can also be uh, a problem here. So jumper's knee could be that uh, your quads are not as strong and it could be that the vastus medialis here, this one is a little bit too weak. And that one tends to be an issue with a lot of people. Now to feel your vastus medialis, I want you to just put your hand on your knee here like this and then just 
bring the knee up into flexion like that. You're sitting in a chair and you feel it go. So that muscle loads in the last 45 degree angle of your flexion like this. Okay, so if you wanted to strengthen that one specifically, this is what you would be doing. So if you're sitting at work and you have a few minutes to, to work your legs, this would be a great one to try that. Now, what this is doing, once this is strengthening here like this, it will actually help track the kneecap more to center, okay? Because if it is out to the side here like that, it means that the muscles here on the outside are probably a little bit stronger and there's an imbalance that's happening here, okay? So there's uh, another muscle here in the hip that also needs to be worked on glutes and and uh, that's time for another issue or another another lesson next lesson anyways but how do you strengthen that and how do you save yourself from from uh, from running incorrectly let's say let's say you're 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 flying along and let's say 10 kilometers or 15 kilometers and you're you're starting to notice that one side is laboring a little bit. And so how do you how do you activate those muscles when you're getting going? It's very easy. Okay. So if you're finding that the muscles here are a little bit tight and it's painting at the knee here a little bit, it's going to be the gluteal muscle that isn't firing right. And so what do you do? So what would what I do is when I am turning one corner or the other way, in, in this case here, would be turning around to the right. So if I'm going around a corner, what I'll do is I'll over accentuate that movement, that hip and glide. So I'm actually marching around the corner, lifting this leg a little bit more, and I'm actually firing this gluteal muscle and it seems to make my hip feel better and also take some of the pain off the knee. Very easy. So, and that's basically how to train up the, these two muscles. So if there's an imbalance there, that's great. And um, this is the way you fix it. Now, pain at the knee, in case you have a runner's knee, then a cold pack to, to the kneecap would be a good idea. Put a cloth in, um, on the knee first and then put the cold pack on and then apply the cold pack for about 10 minutes every hour, okay? You don't want to ice the whole thing, just cool it down. And you'd probably reduce that frequency as the pain also diminishes. So maybe uh, when you get home and you have time for three hours or something like that, apply a cold pack over three hours, but 10 minutes every hour. That would be a rational thing to do. Now, what the heck is going on with the quads? You know, if they are very, very tight, then you have to try and stretch them, right? And so anything around the knee is going to work really well if it's uh, loose and flexible. So I'm big on flexibility stretches and so I'm going to show you one great one that I like to do for the quad. And there is uh, obviously some people that will say, well, you're stretching too much. My stretching sessions are three hours long. So when I'm doing stretching sessions, I get up a little bit earlier in the morning and do my stretches for the legs and lower back. And it's three hours, believe it or not. It goes over really, really fast. And But I do spend a lot of time, but my legs feel fantastic after that. So this is one of the stretches that I'm doing, okay? Uh, try it on your bed, because what I'm going to try and get you to do is appreciate lying on a flat surface. You can do a quad stretch like this, fine. But look at the angle here of your leg as opposed to your body. It's not very straight, right? And so you can glide it back like that and hold it for 10 seconds. But well, that's not going to do very much. So get yourself down on a table here like that or on a bed. Reach back, grab onto your ankle and see your hip here and leg and body is on a flat surface. And you're going to get a decent stretch through the quads. Okay, Hang on to that stretch for at least five minutes. Ten minutes if you can. 
and uh, that's a great stretch, okay? You might find it a little tiring, but that's okay. And if your quads are burning, then that's going to be a really decent stretch. It might be too much, and then if it is, let go for a minute, relax, and then go back to it. You'll find it's a little bit easier, okay? That's an awesome stretch for the quads, one that I enjoy doing. And then of course, if you're going to do the other one and you want to turn your head the other way and then do the other one, grab onto that ankle and stretch away. So that one also does the hip flexors here, which is great because then you'll be able to stand up and uh, stand up straight and then carry on with your day, okay? Very easy to do. Now, let's get into specifics about self-massage and the quads and uh, the hamstrings specifically, okay? Now, there is here on the outside, this tendon here that comes here, this is called the biceps femoris tendon, and it goes underneath the iliotibial band, and you'll be able to reach in there and work it quite well, okay? I'm going to show you in a second, but there's also another area on the quads that are also uh, quite interesting to work on as well. I just want to see here, yeah, I guess we can cover this now, sure. So uh, what I'm looking at here is that if these muscles are tight, especially for the jumper's knee, what you want to do is try to loosen them off, okay? So in my case here, I find that I've got some radiating pain down into the biceps femoris muscle. And to find that, what you're going to do is you're going to hook your muscles, you're going to create a little wedge like that, and you're going to hook at these muscles and try to find a painful area and all what you're doing is, is pinning the muscle, holding the muscle, and then moving your own leg and stretching out like that. And you might find that it might be quite painful. Try to find areas that are painful because those are the areas that you're going to try and work on. Those are the ones that you want to get at it. So I found a nice one here. And all what you're doing is pinning and stretching, okay? Notice my fingers are not moving. They're not gliding over the skin at all. They're just holding and I am doing a self massage on these areas. Now Tillman, can you use a foam roller? Oh yes, you can use a foam roller, most definitely. But foam rollers are great, but sometimes you need to get in there a little bit more specifically if a foam roller doesn't get it quite because they might not. And then that's, that's uh, where you have to go in there and, and work these muscles themselves. Now, on the inner side of the leg here, we have vastus medialis, uh, oh no, no, sorry, uh, semitendinosus and semimembranosus, okay? So semitendinosus is on the outer, outer side and membranosus in, is in the middle, okay? So these muscles here are not all that much of a bother Unless, of course, you, well, for me not, but for some people, especially, let's say, if you're not need, then, or, so, what causes people to be not need? I'm sure that you've looked at other people running and, and their legs are falling in on each other and they're, they're rubbing their thighs together. What is causing that? You know, is it a positional problem? I would assume, yes. So could it be crossing the knees a lot? Perhaps. Is it because the muscles on the inside of the legs are really, really tight? Most definitely. So how are we going to do those? Yeah, are we going to get in there? They're very, very sensitive, right? So what are we going to use? Well, why don't we look at the foam roller? We can use a foam roller for the inside of the legs here, okay? If you're traveling, find yourself a water bottle like this. That works great too. You can get, you can put it on a flat surface, roll around on it, 
and hydrate yourself at the end of it. Very, very good. Cheapest foam roller you got. Okay, so let's try this new one. Okay, so let's say you want to roll out the adductor muscles. Okay, and the adductor muscles, uh, because they are tight, what you're trying to do is get from this kind of a movement back to the knee being straight so that the Q angle on the knee is a little bit more in line. So if it's, if it's all, uh, if you're, if you're like this, then the kneecaps are going to be out to the outside and uh, the wear on the kneecap is going to be a little bit uh, more intense on the outside as it's not tracking quite right in the groove. So what are you going to do with this? Okay, hamstring stretches, sure. Adductor stretches, sure. How do you do it? Well, let's get on the roller like this, just sit on it like this, and then lean yourself over and then roll out the inside of the leg. Okay. Try it like that. And then do the other side as well. I'm just going to do it on this leg here. Okay. Put it down like that. If And the hamstring muscle as well, you can work at like that. Notice that uh, you can do it two ways. You can obviously get yourself legs straight like that and roll, but because you've got your muscles then uh, tightened up, then the roller isn't going to do much because the muscles aren't loose, okay? So you can try it like that, or you can use your own legs and work them back and forth like that on the roller. And I find that doing that sends to, tends to loosen off the hamstrings a little bit better than just uh, rolling back and forth like that. But that's that's me, might not be you, but that's me. Now, on the outside, certainly you can lean on it like that and roll around on the side or just hold that position on, on the roller and that will work those muscles as well. But definitely not as specific as holding on to the muscle itself, okay? So if you were going to hold these muscles specifically and then work them by moving your leg back and forth, I think you'd be a lot more successful in doing that. All right, okay? So if you've got a tracking problem with the knee, there's a few things that we can do here. We can get the knee up on a surface like this and actually move the kneecap back and forth. You can push at it and pull at the kneecap to get it moving a little bit. And if it is jammed at the bottom here, sometimes you'll you'll feel it let go and you'll think, hey, something happened there. It's a little bit looser, okay? You can move it from side to side even. It should move from side to side. If it doesn't, then you've got an issue with tight muscles on either side and it will cause strain there, okay? Then, of course, if you wanted to see the tracking or if you have an issue with tracking, you can even put your foot down like that and just wibble the knee back and forth like that. And by wibbling the knee back, taking the pressure off the knee so that it's just, hold, uh, you're holding it, moving it back and forth like that. Sometimes if you're not tracking properly in the, in the kneecap, then, uh, then you'll get a little clunk out of it and it should correct itself, right? Should, okay? And that's, that's uh, been some of the things that I've done that uh, work really quite well with this. Now, there are other techniques that you can do around the kneecap, definitely. And let's get into that, okay? So um, another problem that happens here in the front here is at the shin bone, okay? This is uh, the, the tuberosity here. A lot of people will kneel on that and it gets sore after a little while. This is called Osgood Schlotters. And what happens is this one gets, uh, it's more by the tuberosity that it's sore and uh, it uh, tends to get sore uh, Osgood Schlotters, let's say Osgood Schlotters happens 
early on in your years between, well, in your teen years. And it's usually from growing pains or growing too fast, and then also high intensity sports. And then, you know, by a 15 or 16, it should go away, but some people get a big, huge bump there. And of course, there's other things that can happen too. There can be uh, bursitis issues and, and then also, you know, if you're, if you're employed or you're, and you need to kneel a lot at your work, let's say if you're an electrician or a plumber, then you got to uh, mind your knees here too, okay? So what happens here after a while, especially when it's chronic, is this will all congest and, and uh, get very, very tight. Even with knee replacements, knee replacements, they usually have an incision that come up and all the way up or over the knee here like that. And so if, if that's the case, then you want to try and do some scar tissue work. So if you've got a line here with a scar, you're going to be anchoring the scar and pulling away at the sides, okay? And that will help in loosening off the underlying fascia tissues and you'll be the scar a little bit more pliable and, and that will help like this. But let's get back to Oscar Schlatter's. If, it's, if this is a chronic thing and you've dealt with this for many years, then some cross frictions is also very good because it'll actually start the healing process again. Okay, so it'll work at it really well. And so what you're going to do here is um, do the cross frictions, okay? And then also with, um, with recovery for this, what can happen here is uh, um, you're going to have to let it rest because it's it's inflamed, if it is inflamed, and then you might get some atrophy of the quads because you're not working them. So what do you do? Do you keep on training? Well, you have to substitute your strength training with skills. So in that case, more uh, cross training, and uh, let's say if it's uh, soccer, it's uh, ball control, ball skills, and stuff like that. Okay. And so, and then you can probably start loading the knee a little bit more and, and get back to where you're doing. All right. So, two more things bursitis. Bursitis is a hell of a thing. There's a, you have five bursas here. You have, one on top of the kneecap, <clears throat> one underneath this tendon, one at the side, and, and one on the inside here, and then one on the back. The back is the Baker cyst. There's not much you can do for that. You can do some massage for that, but usually vascular flush or even cool applications will help with that <clears throat> rest as well. And so... I want to talk here about the the bursa on the inside here. You've got here a large muscle that comes across here, sartorius, and then you have your semitendinosus, membranosus muscles, and then gracilis, which is a deeper muscle on the inside of the leg. They all come across here, the pes and serene bursas here, and sometimes this one gets pretty warm. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. And so you're going to have to focus here in loosening off these muscles. And there's one area here on the inside of the leg that I would like to address here. It's if you were to draw out your vastus medialis, this muscle on the inside, you'll come to a point right there. That's at the top of it. And it's a little sulcus, it's a little indentation. It might be a little sore on you. But this is a, a motor point for that controls the blood circulation to the lower leg. So if you are <clears throat> uh, finding that your feet are always cold or um, that you've got some circulatory issues on the lower leg, this might be an area that you'd like to work and pay attention to. You can use a foam roller or your hand and again, just hold and move the leg around. Or if you want, you can use a massager as well. Um, I tend to like to use the Hometics massager. 
it's got um, it's got two bulbs instead of the one. And a lot of people like the Theragun. I don't know, probably because it's got the word gun involved in it, but I find this one a lot easier to use. So hang on a second. I just got to get a little drink of water. So I'm going to use my foam roller here. You're very good. See, putting the foam roller to use. All right. So bursitis. Crazy situations. Oh, my man. So another area that can <clears throat> be a problem with bursitis is any kind of infection. So if you happen to fall while running, get road rash or something like that, <clears throat> then you're going to have to go to a doctor, get it cleaned out. Because if it's deep and it gets infected, you could probably lose the leg. No kidding. <clears throat> but that's a story for another day. I actually had a client that almost lost a leg because of not uh, looking out for a road rash. Don't worry, I'll be okay. <clears throat> All right. So always go see a doctor. Even if you've got little lumps in behind here, if it's a like baker cyst or something like that, it might be uh, a cyst or it could be a fatty deposit. It could be a tumor. It could be an aneurysm. All these things, right? So have them checked out first before you start moving stuff around in there. I want to address another area that is your, your uh, inside the knee here on both sides. It's the meniscus injuries. And so sometimes you'll get a lot of tension in the back of the knee and you don't know what to do about it, I guess. But here I've learned that if you can bring these two fingers together and put them on the inside of the knee, you can probably dig in a little bit, loosen yourself off, and then slowly move your <clears throat> foot back and forth here like that. And what you're doing is you're applying a little bit of pressure to the fascia that is by the meniscus. It might be a little bit sore, especially if you have a meniscus injury, but it will cause a lot of relief because you're stretching that area of the fascia. Okay, try it on this side here. All right, so again, on the inside of this tendon, you're just going to hook two fingers right on the inside Loosen the muscles off, okay, and then slowly flex and extend the leg, okay, just like that. And you'll be able to touch the meniscus even, might be a little sore, that's okay. What you're doing is you're working the fascia, oh, fascia all through the knee here. That might give you a little bit of relief. Not so much in the center here, just behind the tendons, okay? Just behind the tendons. <clears throat> I, can, I can actually bring my other fingers there to gu help guide. And then this side here too. Okay, good. Very important. So those are really crazy areas, right? All right, so last thing is osteoarthritis, oh my goodness. So osteoarthritis happens usually through trauma, injury, you know, and if that's the case, then that's uh, a big deal. Hang on, this is... All right, good to go. So um, if you have injured yourself, okay, with uh, and you have some osteoarthritis going on, uh, it's probably going to get a little bit more sore when you're running. So maybe uh, choose smaller distances or choose a walk-run program or um, choose swimming and cycling. But any kind of load, if it is osteoarthritis, then it's, it's just going to get worse. And so save yourself. You need your knees for a long time unless you want to, um, you know, get some artificial knees and then 
I think your running days are over anyways by that time. But I have seen people run on artificial knees. I don't know how they're doing it, but they do it. So what have we got here? Okay. So if it is um, <clears throat> a uh, osteoarthritic knee, what's going to happen is the cartilage is going to go down. The bones are going to get larger. You're going to get some osteophyte formations. And of course, there's going to be inflammation inside the knee. What can you do about this? Well, you can put a cool pack on the knee that will help. And you can also put a, a compression garment over the knee that will help with the swelling. Or <clears throat> you can get even a brace that will take the pressure off the inside of the knee. That will also help. <clears throat> and then, of course, there is lifestyle stuff like uh, the um, wonderful um, yoga pose. It's, um, for example, I came across this thing the other day. I was reading up on, on uh, osteoarthritis in the knee, and I found out that that India has uh, a higher amount of, of um, cases of osteoarthritis than the rest of the world. And it said North America, which was really crazy. But it said that India has 15% more cases of osteoarthritis, particularly in postmenopausal women. So it's like, okay, so what are they doing that is is causing this. And, uh, and I thought, yeah, okay, well, it's got to be crossing their knees. It could be the, the, um, the position that people get in, in at their gurdwars or, you know, when they're doing their prayers. And uh, it could be that when you're postmenopausal, post that there is a higher degree of, uh, you know, in, insufficiencies with hormone imbalances and stuff like that, that uh, and start to start, start to uh, work away at the mineral content of the knee. Anyways, so I've seen lots of people, East Indians, uh, in my practice, and some older ladies, they walk with really bold legs, they were dung, 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 down the street, and it's like, what's going on with with their knees and yeah, it's mostly because they've gotten into this habit of sitting cross-legged and, and I thought, boy, oh boy. So there's there's one thing that if anybody can change is uh, is uh, if you know anybody that is, is older and sitting cross-kneed like that or cross-legged, um, get them to maybe look at changing their their positions because uh, and nobody's interested in seeing you wreck your knees. Nobody at all, believe me. And so if it's just a silly position that you're in and you've done this all your life and you've worn out the inner side of your knees from it, then it might be a good idea to maybe change the way that you're doing things. So in with the with osteoarthritis, there's also a lot of exercises that you can do. You can do walking, cycling, swimming, aerobic exercises, all these things really, really beneficial for that, okay? So, I don't know, you know, there's even, if you have shooting pain in the knee, that's probably an osteoarthritic knee, especially if you're standing for long periods of time or going up and down stairs. What other damage can you do to the knee? There's the cruciate ligaments in the knee. There is the collateral ligaments on the either side of them. And usually if they're if they're if they've been touched or if they've been uh, damaged in any case, then it's going to end up being a sloppy knee. You know, there's all sorts of sports and that you can uh, hurt your knees in. You know, you can even damage your meniscus as well. And uh, there's people that walk around with a little mice that float around in the fluid inside the knee and it locks on them. They can still function good, but then at one point in time, it's it's like, okay, can't do it anymore because my knee has to settle down. So if that's the case, then you might, the only uh, option might be to go see a doctor and uh, see about some corrective measures for the knee. Okay. So I hope my my talk uh, tonight was uh, 
beneficial. There is one other area that I wanted to show you here too. Some people get a problem on the outside of the knee, and this is usually a problem with the fibular head of the uh, bone here of the fibula. So I just like you to put your hand here on on your on your leg here on your outside and just move your foot back and forth like that. If you can feel the bone here at the top, the fibular head moving back and forth, you're good to go. And if it's not moving, then it might be an issue, right? And so if it's not moving, then you can always mobilize it as well. And I'm telling you this because it's also part of the knee, right? So how do you mobilize this one, right? We put your leg up here like this, and then you're going to put the heel of your hand in behind and the other hand on top, and you're going to move the lower leg back and forth like that, shim it back and forth. Okay, you can even try with the foot moving it back and forth here like that, but just moving it anterior and posteriorly like that tends to get that one going. So if it's jammed at all, or you're feeling some pain on the side, then that might be what it is. Okay, other things that are a problem here, of course, is the iliotibial band, and it has to do with tension at the hip, and there's many, many stretches for the IT band that you can do. Um, there is one that I'd love to show you too, and I'm going to do that just as the last thing that I'm going to show you here. I'm going to use this leg, and I'm going to hang it off the back of the table here, okay? So you're going to lie on your bed like this, and then simply hang the leg off the back. And you'll feel a good stretch here on the hip, and at the top of the hip here, okay? This is an awesome iliotibial band stretch because all the rest of the muscles are in a neutral position and the focus and the tension is here on the iliotibial band, okay? So there's no need to go up against the wall and do that like you've had done in high school forever in a day ago, yeah? So anyways, now I'd like to open it up for questions. It's uh, it's uh, been half an hour of talking, so please ask away. I, I really quickly just wanted to sort of mention about the cross-legged um, sitting because what the the first time that I went to go see my current RMT within like minutes of touching me, she was like, you sit cross-legged. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, so funny. what? Yeah. yeah, and she was like, in fact, it's your right leg over your left leg. And so her suggestion for me, because I'm like, I just, I think I kind of get bored when I'm sitting. And so then you just kind of move your legs around. Um, and so her suggestion were those spiky balls. Yeah. She's like, if you just kind of put one on the floor underneath you, then you can like put your foot on top of it and just kind of roll that out every once in a while and, and that'll kind of distract you from that boredom but I that was one of my questions was just kind of how how bad is sitting cross-legged for you it's it's not good at all you know in if if these muscles on the inside of the legs tighten up or are tight you just have at your next race Look at people in front of you, if you're in the race or if you're watching or you're volunteering or something like that, look at how many people are running with their knees closer together. They're not neutral position like up and down. There's no space in between the legs. These people have tight adductor muscles and that's from sitting cross-legged like this or I can't even get into the, to the yoga position. This is how tight I am, but like this, you know, that's all tight here. Yeah, I know. I'm bad like that, hey. But, anyways, so those are um, needing hip opener exercises, which I'll cover in the next uh, session. Uh, the next session is all on hip and lower back. So if if that is an interest to you, then please tune in again. Is there any other questions? I have a question. Yes, Jennifer. Okay, so I did a race, stupidly long uh, race in Ros in Rossland, and I didn't finish, and they had to take us down the mountain, and it was a bunch of, like, just stepping down and stepping down and stepping down and stepping down. And then at the end of it, I could not bend my leg after that. Like, it could not bend my knee. It was 
that was it. And I thought, what the hell is going on? And I've asked my doctor about it. He has no idea, like oh. what I did. So um, it was, could be one of two things. So dehydration is the first thing that I would look at. Okay. And uh, then uh, was it, it, were you just timed out of the race or something? Yeah. Like that? Did you not yeah. get the cutoff? I got, yeah, I, I, I missed the cutoff. Yeah. So uh, it probably is uh, the first thing that jumps out at me is dehydration. And the second thing uh, would be just uh, muscle tightness. And that could be because of dehydration or just uh, your effort was so, so strong and probably uh, might have been. I mean, Rossland is pretty hilly, man. Holy cow. Yeah, we were, Charlie and I were doing Broken Goat. Oh, okay. So uh, <clears throat> I did an ultra once at Sun Peaks, and that was um, a all day brutal event up, up and down the ski hills two times. And uh, I was fully knackered after that, could hardly move either. So, you know, it, it's, um, it could be, um, dehydration conditioning is another one okay maybe you didn't condition yourself to hills or something like that and the effort was just too strong for the legs so that probably if your knees are okay right now then i would say that there is probably not anything wrong with the with the knees anything lasting was there any pain on the top of the knee or underneath the knee or on the sides or in the back it's hard to remember now because now it was already a couple of years ago, but it was like just it was my whole knee like it. I remember lying on the bed after the race and I couldn't even lift my leg up and over the bed to get off to go to the bathroom. Like I was in so much pain that my husband had to like lift my leg up and swing it over so I could get off the bed. Yeah, so that that's just uh, probably muscle fatigue. And um, and then uh, the next day, probably uh, a symptom that's that's called DOMS, and uh, that's uh, uh, delayed onset and muscle soreness. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's what I think that happened there. And it's probably again uh, dehydration and conditioning. That's probably what it was. Yeah, because it just felt like it was locked. So I've yeah. had it. I've had it happen a couple of times over the course of running, at the at the end of a half marathon one time, and then this time. So yeah, yeah where it's like I can't bend it anymore. I just have to keep it straight. Yeah. So uh, one good thing to do after longer races like that, even if it's a ten k, is keep moving. If you stop or sit down, you're going to have a big problem in getting up. Okay, so always keep moving, and uh, and and the reason for that is your uh, blood and circulation uh, in the legs is still wide open, and and uh, well, if you if you don't keep on moving, then then your body's not going to have anything to pump around your body anymore, and you may fall flat on your face, or and, and that happens. You know, you see that a lot, especially with half marathons and, and full marathons. And uh, then people are lying down on the ground with their legs up to try and get the circulation back into their body. And uh, or, you know, having uh, a, a kit bag put on their tummy to try and press the blood out of their organs to keep them going and circulated. But that's... Um, that's another thing altogether. So, you know, just keep on moving after a uh, a marathon or half marathon, and and maybe some of the the delayed muscle onset soreness might not uh, materialize as strongly for you. There's uh, other things to consider too: electrolyte imbalance, but that's again partly dehydration. Thank you. You're welcome. We did have another question that came up here in the chat. Um, what causes cramps and how can how do you get rid of them quickly? Oh, the cramps. So what causes them is uh, probably 
dehydration is number one and uh, conditioning is number two so if if you haven't trained properly for an event or if you if you've been skimping here and say ah, i don't feel like it today i don't feel like it today or that then these are one of the things that you're going to have to um be open to experiencing is, is maybe there might be some cramping okay and so um what how do you prepare for that certainly if your muscles are really really tight then there is an issue with that too, right? And so, um, like I said early on in this segment, my stretches or my stretching sessions are three hours long, okay? I'm an old guy, Claude, old body, right? So do I need to stretch that long? Oh, my muscles feel so much better when I do that. And so even before a race, um, I'll get up um, a little bit earlier in the morning, go through my routines, and I'm not going to stretch three hours long uh, the day of a race, but it might be an hour, you know? And so if if your muscles are loose and they're flexible, and chances are you're not going to have cramps, okay? Uh, that's different for the lower leg because what can happen there is through overtraining, then you're going to get compartmental syndromes. And so that's where if you start to feel some numbness in the foot or pain down the leg, then you're going to say, oh, oh okay, where is that coming from? And you're going to have to try and find out where it is. Recap last week, you're going to put your thumbs, the long part of the thumb here on the inner side of the shin bone and push down and then do little circles with your with your foot back and forth like that this is the tibialis posterior muscle that you're targeting there that's uh, a posterior shin splint one that isn't really looked at a lot or isn't uh, really dealt with a lot but if you are having lower leg problems then this is a good technique to do and it will save a lot of cramping in the back of the leg there's uh, another compartment here on the front, the peroneal muscles. And so you're going to take your fingers, hook them in the front here. And also, contrary to any kind of schools of thought, you're going to drive your fingers down between the muscle and the bone here like that. And that will stretch out the muscle through there. But you can hook at the top right at the curve, at this bony curve, and then wiggle your foot around again like this. And that will take a lot of the pressure off the peroneal muscles, okay? Like that. There's another muscle here in the back, right behind the um, fibula, and it's the peroneus brevis muscle. And it's one of the muscles that are a problem with, uh, let's say, if you rolled your ankle or you have a, a high uh, ankle injury. And so that muscle, when it's strained, can cause a lot of problems with foot flexion. Now what you're going to do is you're going to find that muscle, put your thumb against it, and then wiggle your foot again like that, up and down. And that's going to relieve a lot of the pressure there like that. So those compartmental issues is when the muscles are overworked and there's only so much room in that compartment and the muscle keeps on growing and growing it's going to compress on itself and it's going to become very very tight and sore and that might also cause some cramping certainly circulation is also another issue that can cause cramping and uh, that's where uh, applications of cooling let's say if you're going to go stand in the cold water or something like that or even in the shower and redirect the shower head cold down the leg like that, and then just simply strip the uh, strip the water off the, the leg like this. That has a, such a refreshing effect for the leg, and you you'll feel like a hundred bucks afterwards. Really, it, it's amazing how a little bit of cold water on the leg can help with that. That might solve the cramping. Uh, there's other issues with. Uh, it's more of a muscle spasm if there is a, let's say if there's a bone out of place in the foot and you got a little bit of a spasm going there, it's probably because the body's trying to correct that positioning and, and it's letting you know there's something wrong. But 
it might go all the way up the leg or it might be a, a cramp like that that might happen in bed or sleeping so uh there's many different things that can cause cramping varicose veins is another thing so you can take a rolling pin and roll the back of the leg out a little bit if you think that that's an issue so cramping big topic lots of different ways to solve issues with that but uh hopefully one of those might be um the cure-all for your situation All right any other questions nothing else in the chat here so going once <laughs> going twice if there's no other questions, uh, I'm going to end recording. Okay. And see you next time. Next time for the hip and for the lower back. <laughs>